Okay, well, I won't name the number of years, but it's a significant um, history. I began as a, a mechanical engineer. Um, I uh, worked in the jet engine industry in Phoenix, Arizona. And after about seven years, I became increasingly curious about why we won certain projects and why we didn't win others. Um, <clears throat> as an engineer, the sort of mantra in the day was, you could get yourself fired in a couple of ways. Um, one would be to get it technically wrong. The other would be to be late, uh, but they never really cared about cost. And that to me was a, a bit of a disconnect because when I went and bought anything, a car or groceries or anything, cost was always important to me. So why wouldn't it be to someone who's buying an engine or something like that? And uh, at that point, I, I decided I wanted to get a little bit more advanced in, in my knowledge of, of the whole business that I was in. <clears throat> and I started out pursuing a, a PhD in engineering. And I lasted two days. And I, I just had to pick up my books and, and Dr. Floor sheets. I can't do this anymore. And I walked out and instead pursued an MBA. And that was the beginning of a sea change for me. When I completed it, I was really hoping that they would transfer me into the business operations part of that business. But once an engineer, always an engineer to some of these people. And uh, I, I just had to escape. And I, um, I, I presented a paper for a, an industry group, which was at the time known as the National Security Industry Association. And I had a couple of consulting firms from California offer me a position. And I took one with one of them and they started traveling me around and all over North America. Um, I became more familiar with St. John New Brunswick than I really wanted to be in the middle of February, but it was a great experience. And I turned out to be kind of their specialist in shipyard operations, shipbuilding. And uh, that led me to a, an opportunity over in uh, Adelaide, Australia. And I was on a one to two year assignment that lasted 12 years. And uh, it, it enabled me to go into business for myself and practice consulting that uh, change management consulting and business capture consulting with uh, close to 60 organizations throughout Australasia and picked up a few neat skills there. One was to shed the whole notion of one size fits all when it comes to a management system and that there are are all kinds of priorities and sizes of organizations and the ability to understand an environment and tailor a solution to that environment became one of my specialties. And I think I make mention of that in my background. In any event, I was opening up a new opportunity in Indonesia. And one morning, the driver was going to take me to this aircraft factory. And there were all these soldiers all along this boulevard. And I said, Woody, what's with all the men? And he says, oh, slight problem. And I said, what slight problem? And he said, oh, the government collapsed last night. I said, take me back to the hotel. <laughs> Let's go to the airport. And so I went home and my wife at the time said, well, what are you doing home now? You shouldn't be home for another week or so. And I said, told her the story. And she said, yeah, well, OK, now it's my turn to live overseas. And that, that led us to Seattle, Washington. And <clears throat> I went to work for a company, which was at the time called DMR Consulting Group. Actually, they're a, a Canadian-based company. They have a center of excellence in Montreal. Uh, they're, the operations that was managing our division in Seattle, Washington, was based in Alberta. And uh, they had developed a practice, which was just fascinating to me, called benefits realization. It's all about the value of information technology to the business or to the society, not just the technical nature of whether you can log on so many people per hour, you know, or trivia like that, but rather than uh, if you do stand up a new healthcare system, will it improve healthcare outcomes for the population? You know, real, you know, dining room table issues that people care about. And I felt like this is an opportunity for me to finally create the equation between how long it takes to create something, how much money it takes to create something, and what does it do for people. And so it really is all about value proposition. And I found that very interesting and I pursued it. 
and that is one of my specialties in terms of designing solutions for clients. Now, along the way, you you don't really put food on the table unless you can win business too. You know, you have the greatest solution in the world, but I became pretty adept at helping companies design an approach to winning business. And that's what I call capture strategy. And so when I self-describe myself in, in five words or less, um, I'm not only a, a a business strategy person, but I'm also a business capture person. So that's that's me in a nutshell these days. You know, there's there's just this uh, fierce independence that I've got. Um, you can't really make your own hours in there. That's a, a bit of a fallacy. You find yourself in this business struggling constantly with how much you charge for yourself and how much work you get to do. Um, and it it's uh, just as a bit of an aside, I'm a, I'm an artist, a professional artist as well. I, I do abstract acrylic art. And it's the same conundrum. How much do you charge for a painting? You really, really want to sell it. So you put $10 on it. But pretty soon you're branded as, you know, a cheap hunk of junk maker. So the same goes for you as a as pricing your profession. You have to elevate your pricing to a degree where you you look like a premium product, but you can't go out there saying that I'm worth a thousand dollars an hour because you might work one hour a year doing that. Um, <clears throat> so that was that was one of the interesting educational things I picked up as, as a consultant. But you're right, the nine to five routine. Um, existence was just not for me. One of the things when I, I've, I've been in and out of employment for a long time. And one of the things I noticed when I was in employment is that one of your main activities during a work week is meetings. And when you get into the culture of meetings, I found that quite often a good quarter of the time spent in a meeting is planning the next meeting. And I began to dawn on me that this is just ridiculous. You know, I've got work to do. Now, when I, when I left that company um, 13, 14 years ago, I found that I could get to work, say, two hours later than I would have to leave to get into traffic because I just walk down the hall and sit down and turn the computer on. And I would get home two hours earlier than when I would finally emerge from traffic. And um, I got more done. And I thought, this is, this is very cool, you know? Plus, if someone wanted to go to lunch and, you know, just, it was a nice day, you could do that and still get your work done. And it's just the freedom of being a consultant is uh, is really, really rewarding. Uh, now, the other side of things is oftentimes it's feast or famine. Um, during COVID, the hours were pretty good. But after COVID was over, it just dropped off. And I don't know why that is, but it did. So it, it's you go through slow periods and, and um, you go through very, very lucrative periods. But it's just the nature of the beast. Everybody likes to keep schedules and things like that. Uh, and I'm good at it. I mean, I've done schedules for very complicated projects and things, but I don't use them for the work that I do. I basically work off of punch lists and calendars and things like that. So in order organizing my time, I classify myself as a fairly organized person. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, here's here's one. <clears throat> I discovered at some point in my life that um, I'm what a what I classify as an iconic learner. I, I can't read, and I never could in in college read the textbook. I'd always go to the pictures in the book, you know. I, and maybe that's why I draw pictures of things. And I just have always been quick on the uptake with uh, software applications. And they used to call me the hacker. Um, so I, and I look at the, my tray here of, and I'd say 
half of those are graphic arts applications and um, you know video production applications. That's the way I communicate. Um, I, I'm I'm not a Tolstoy, you know. I'm more like a Gary Larson. You know, I don't know if, it, if it's worth bringing it up. I found myself enjoying the client environment that I was in less and less in the past five years. And uh, these would be large federal agency environments. And I was telling my younger son, I don't know why this is. And he says, well, part of the reason is, and he's uh, around 40. He says, I, I manage both baby boomers and millennials. And dad, I can tell you, they don't mix very well. <laughs> and I said, I don't understand why. I've got no problem with them. And he, he had a couple of theories about that. But <clears throat> there was another thing I had about the, the, um, what's the best way to put this? The culture in a, in a public organization versus the culture in a self-employed organization are like night and day. And when you're, when you're trapped in having to go into their environment and sit in their meetings with them and things like that, it's like, where's the door? <laughs> I got to get away. But now it, that's, that's all gone away now that it's all virtual because you can interact with people as they need you. And uh, the, the rest of it is all just very productive time. Well, this is kind of a cliche, but um, under promise and over deliver. Uh, some of the funnest, most profitable years I've had was in a competitive environment. And in, in terms of business capture, I batted a thousand. And people say, well, how that's unheard of. Uh, especially in a, in a blanket purchase agreement environment where you've got competition. And I said, I learned after a few years that what was happening was the business development or the capture wasn't from the time that the request for a quote or the request for proposal came out. By then, if you were in a position of winning, it was already too late. You've probably lost. And so I spent an inordinate amount of time becoming friends with the people who would be my client, not socially, but in terms of business, in terms of um, attending events, professional events, uh, luncheons, things like that, where people are more relaxed, unlike making an appointment to go in and meet with their boss and say, here's my basket of tricks, you should buy this. No, in a casual conversation over a pizza or something like that, they'll say, well, what's, what's been going on in, in, with you lately? I said, I, you know, for example, just came up with this really cool little tool that I, I found really helps to do X, Y, and Z. They'll say, yeah, really? That is cool. You should come in and show my boss something like that. And so, you know, it, uh, it works out like that. Another one is uh, under promise and over deliver. Sometimes you get lucky. And on one occasion, it was it, the, the fiscal year for the government runs from October through September. And in and around July or August, at one point, you'd start really beating the bushes because there might be a scenario where they have money that they haven't spent and they want to spend it or else they're not gonna get it next year. Okay, so we're having a, a discussion with the guy and he says, okay, Hot Rod, here's what I'd like to see if you can do. Here's a project. And you say that you can give us an independent assessment of what this thing should take in terms of money and time. You're on. We're gonna tell you very little about it you say you've got all of these spiffy tools um, and we'll give you X thousands of dollars. You come back in 
a month and give us the answer. And so we did that. We came back. This is the number, what we think it should cost in terms of money and time. And they're looking at the presentation and they said, what's, what's that factor there in the spreadsheet? And I answered, well, that's the amount of money that the model estimated would be needed for the engineering and the program management aspect of it. And they said, that's ridiculously low. And that's not even believable. And answered, well, that's basically based on industry averages. I said, oh, no, no, no. Our contractor takes the, that, triples that. And I said, well, they're ripping you off. And they, the other one, a boss, said, that, that, let's just table that discussion for now. Anyhow, we won, a, I'll say the number, $10 million worth of business based on that little experiment. And I was in the uh, deputy secretary's office one day, just say, how's it going? Are you happy with the troops and all of this sort of stuff? And he said, I'll tell you a story. You know, you, you guys, for that $75,000 that we spent on you, you saved the taxpayers 25 million bucks. And I thought, well, that's very cool you know, to know that you can deliver that kind of a service. This is benefits realization in the real world, you know. So, yeah, it can be very, very satisfying if you underpromise and overdeliver. DIY has always been a challenge, and that, that goes back to the beginning, and that organizations are reluctant to pay the premium it takes to get a consultant in uh, because they think they can do it themselves until they get themselves in a pickle. And, you know, then they reluctantly come and try to do it as cheaply as they can. Good clients understand the value of experience and they'll, they'll pay for it. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges that, that I've, would say today is the <clears throat> some of the some of the procurement rules in governments and this is general around the world not just in the united states but we find that, and i'm i wouldn't call myself a, a boutique premium consultant i i price myself fairly competitively unlike some of the big six consultants where they're, they're getting very rewarding day rates. But there's a thing in acquisition called lowest price technically acceptable. And you'll find that um, emerging companies who aren't very experienced and not very capable can put together a, uh, a proposal, a technical proposal that's technically acceptable and then they win by low bidding. Now, we had this happen like eight, 10 years ago on an opportunity. And I, I asked my partner at the time, Gustavo, what happened? And he said, you know what? We were, we were superior. In fact, we were cheaper. But what they found was that our solution was threatening because it, it was gonna, build in so much transparency that they didn't want that. And I thought, well, well, that's pretty upside down. Anyhow, it turns out I was talking to him about a year and a half later. And he says, you know, that, that job. And I said, yeah. And he said, they were fired. The company that was technically acceptable lowest price because they were incapable of doing what they needed to do. So as whereas we were technically superior, but threatening, they picked someone who was inferior, but acceptable and non-threatening. But at the end of the day, they were exposed as being incompetent. Now, you might say, oh, well, it's good that, you know, what goes around comes around. The problem is in the year in between, there was very little work going around. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a challenge. 